Good evening, and welcome to our worship service tonight. This evening, we have an opportunity to celebrate the Festival of the Transfiguration, a rather strange event in the life of Jesus where he reveals his glory one last time to his disciples prior to the time that he goes to Jerusalem, and his glory is now hidden under the humiliation that he suffers on his way to the cross. Not that the glory is gone. It's a little bit more like the sun. It's behind the clouds, perhaps, but it's always there. And the glory of Jesus Christ will one day shine again. So we'll see that glory of Christ in our worship service this evening. The order of service is printed up here on the screens. We'll begin this evening by singing our first hymn, How Good Lord to Be Here. God our Father, each day is a gift of your grace. Your mercies are new every morning. Guide our steps by the light of your word. Shield us from harm and keep us from evil. Better than life is your love. Put joy in our hearts and praise on our lips. Alleluia. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin, nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
So the season of Epiphany is the season when we get a chance to see the glory of God. Jesus reveals himself to be the Son of God and the Savior of the world through his wonderful words and his miraculous works. We need to hold on to that vision of his glory that we see in Epiphany and especially tonight on the festival of the Transfiguration because as he now goes to the cross, that glory is going to be hidden. Our first lesson tonight comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah leaves this world in a glorious fashion. We don't see it with our own eyes, but the passing of every Christian is as glorious as that of Elijah. Because when we pass from this world, the Lord is taking us to his heavenly home. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as, soon as, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the, the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly... A chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. The word of our Lord. Let's now join in reading responsively a psalm of praise, Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord from the earth. Lightning and hail, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In our first lesson, we saw how the glory of God sh shines in Elijah's departure. Now we see the glory of God connected with the, old, the other great Old Testament prophet, Moses. 
through Moses, the law came to God's people in a very glorious way. But as the Apostle Paul describes it in our second lesson today, far more glorious than the law of Moses is the gospel that focuses our attention on Jesus Christ. We read from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 2. Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia, a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Alleluia. Please stand now for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for this evening is recorded in the ninth chapter of Mark's gospel, beginning with verse 2. This is the rather curious event of the transfiguration. And here we see Jesus revealed in all his glory, speaking with Elijah, whom we heard about in the first reading, and Moses, whom we heard about in that second reading. The disciples here then see a glimpse of heaven, but first Jesus will suffer the humiliation of the cross. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We'll continue by singing our next hymn.
Today in our sermon, we'll be focusing on our gospel lesson. I'll just reread one verse. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is God's word. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, dear fellow redeemed. Today we're going to talk about glory. So what is glory? Well, we have the Oxford definition of glory up on the screen. Glory is high renown or honor won by notable achievements. Second definition is magnificence or great beauty. That's what glory is. And if you read the Bible, you'll find out that uh, usually when the Bible uses the word glory, it's also talking about usually there's something shining or a bright light or something like that. For example, in the Christmas story, uh, when the angels appear to the shepherds, it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. So something that has glory or that is glorious is this high achieving, powerful, beautiful, magnificent thing, shining, beautiful. That's what glory is. You know, some examples always help to get concepts in our head. So what might be something that has glory or is glorious? Well, in sports, we might say winning the Super Bowl is glorious. We just had that happen on uh, this past Sunday. In football, there is no higher achievement. Winning the Super Bowl is the highest achievement. If your team wins a Super Bowl, they are the best for that season. And lots of people sure do glorify this event. I mean, 96 million people watched the Super Bowl on Sunday. And if they win, they get a big shiny trophy, right? The Vince Lombardi trophy. So maybe winning the Super Bowl, maybe that can be considered glorious, something that has glory. But if you're not all that into sports, maybe we could think of the Met Gala as uh, being glorious. For those of you who don't know, the Met Gala is just this big fashion party. In fact, a writer for Vogue magazine says the Met Gala is the Super Bowl of fashion. At this party of parties, only the highest ranking celebrities are invited, you know, the ones who have really achieved in movies or music or Broadway. And as you can see on the screens, the celebrities arrive on the red carpet in these fabulous outfits and the paparazzi takes pictures and you always have to, have to say, oh, who wore the best outfit at the Met? gala so exclusive party with celebrities bringing glory to this party and shiny and fabulous maybe that's something that would be considered glorious but you know as glorious as those two events are the gospel writer mark tells us about something that makes those two events look like plastic jewelry by comparison. This is the gospel, writer's Mar the gospel writer Mark's account of the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, they were so frightened. 
Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. So shortly before Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the final time to die on the cross, we have this event called the Transfiguration. Jesus takes his inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, takes them up on a mountain, and he gives them a glimpse of his glory. And just look at how the gospel writer Mark describes it. He says Jesus was dazzling, shining white. His clothes were whiter than anyone could bleach them. What Mark is trying to say is this was whiter than you can even imagine. Imagine the whitest piece of clothing you can. It was even whiter than that. That's how brightly Jesus was shining. Much more shining than the Vince Lombardi trophy, much more glorious than any of the celebrity outfits at the Met Gala. He was glorious. And not only that, but look who showed up to this event. It says that Moses and Elijah appeared and talked with Jesus. These are some high-ranking Old Testament celebrities. Moses was the greatest preacher of the law, and Elijah was the greatest preacher of repentance. So the invited guests sure brought glory to this occasion. And the disciples were absolutely starstruck. Have you ever seen something so amazing that you're just kind of dumbfounded and and you don't really know what to say and anything you do say sounds kind of dumb? Well, that's kind of what happens to Peter here. He's so amazed and dazzled and frightened by this scene that he goes, Whoa, Jesus, it's good to be here. Uh, Can I set up some tents? Tents? Yeah, you know, I don't even think the Ritz-Carlton would be nice enough for this glorious occasion. I certainly don't think tents set up with sticks and stones by some fishermen would be nice enough to honor this occasion. The gospel writer Luke, I love his note on this uh, story. After Peter says this, Luke has this note where he says he didn't know what he was saying. So uh, Peter's brain had been kind of turned to mush by the glory and awesomeness, and he didn't know what he was saying. Let's set up three tents. And to top it all off, Jesus has achieved the greatest thing that can be achieved. God the Father comes in a cloud, and then he says, This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. Jesus has achieved the love and endorsement of God the Father. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Love and endorsement. Brothers and sisters, there is no other greater award or honor to be gotten than the love and endorsement of God the Father. This is a glorious event. Jesus was bright and shining. It was attended by Old Testament celebrities. The audience was starstruck, and Jesus has just received the highest honor possible. Love and endorsement of God the Father. So after considering all that, let's consider you and me. How many of you have been uh, feeling glorious lately? Yeah, I don't know if glory is something we feel all that often. You know, for most of us, maybe we would think, well, my glory days are kind of past. You know, for some of us, maybe the last time we felt glory was... uh, when we were on a sports team in high school and our sports team went to state. Or maybe for us the last time we felt glorious was when we got a promotion at work, but that was many years ago. Or maybe the last time we felt glorious was when we brought home a good report card. Maybe the last time we felt glorious was uh, 
was on our wedding day when we looked our best and all the attention was on us. Perhaps we haven't been feeling too glorious. And even if we have, glory always seems to pass away, right? It doesn't stick around. Even an event as glorious as winning the Super Bowl or going to the Met Gala, that glory passes away. There's always a new crop of rookies, right? Looking to play football and gain the glory for themselves. There's always another person trying to get that fame, trying to push the others out of the spotlight so it can be on them, and then they in turn get pushed out of the spotlight. Glory passes away. I think we all long for glory. Even if you're a shy person, a shy, humble person, I think all of us have a little bit of a desire for some glory, for some honor and uh, recognition and to feel good about ourselves. We all long for some glory. And I think we long for glory because we lost our glory. When sin entered this world, our perfect, glorious condition was lost, and we all became sinful, and we do very unglorious things when we sin. Remember, the Bible says, uh, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So because of sin, any glory that we achieve on this earth quickly fades away. And because we sin, more often than not, it seems like instead of feeling glorious, we feel shame and humiliation. Because that's what sin does to us. So when we look at Jesus' transfiguration and and think of our own sin and how we lack glory, how it seems like Jesus and God's glory is the most unaccessible thing there is. There's no way we can make it into the presence of God's glory. He's just too glorious. But before we despair too much, Let's listen to one more verse of our reading. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. So after this glorious scene where Jesus gives them a glimpse of his divinity and Moses and Elijah are there and bright shining light and God the Father, after this wonderful thing, Jesus hides his glory again. And it's just Jesus there with his disciples, their friend and their teacher. Brothers and sisters, the disciples did not deserve to be shown a glimpse of God's glory. But because Jesus loved them, he showed them his glory and then hid it away again so that they could again interact with their loving friend and teacher. And brothers and sisters, Jesus has done the same thing for us. He knew that we could not reach up to the glory of God. It was a task that would be impossible for us. So God brought his glory down to us. He took on human flesh so that we could interact with the glorious God in a way that we could understand and talk to and touch and hear and listen to. God brought his glory down to us. He did that so that he could give all of us access to his glory. And how did he do that? By dying for us. And Jesus' death was anything but glorious. First he was beaten and mocked, spat upon, given an unfair trial, then stripped naked and nailed to a wooden pole to be left out in the elements to die. 
that death was not glorious. That was the most humiliating death that the Romans could come up with. Why did the most glorious being in the universe allow himself to experience such humiliation? Why did he let that happen? He did it so he could bring you glory. As we go through this life, we experience shame and humiliation, and we long for glory, but any glory we achieve passes away. But Jesus fixed that problem by giving us access to eternal glory. After we pass away, we will be glorified. We get to go up and be in the presence of God and experience his glory forever. And even now, even now while we're here on this earth, we've been given glory. Our second reading for today said this. We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You've been given glory by Jesus. You too are sons and daughters of the Father whom he loves. I see a lot of glorious people before me today. Don't forget that as you leave. And it's a glory that will never fade. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand for the prayers. Today in our intercessions, we include Mrs. Kelly Boss, who is still considering a call that she has received to Calvary, Calvary Lutheran in Bellevue, Washington. We pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for inviting us into your glory. Thank you for making us glorious through the death and resurrection of your glorious Son. Now, Lord, let us glorify your name as we live our lives in service to you. Lord, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We ask that you bless Mrs. Boz as she delivers, deliberates her call. Give her the wisdom to see where she can best serve in your kingdom. And whatever decision, Lord, let your glory shine through her. 
We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may remain standing as we sing our closing hymn. Good evening once again. Nice to see you all on a chilly evening tonight. A few announcements that we would like to make before we show the Wells Connection this evening. First of all, a Financial Peace University is going to be starting next week. Pastor Janish, is that on Thursday evening? Thursday evening next week here, and it'll be offered in which part of the church? In the commons or in the in the commons on Thursday evening. Ash Wednesday worship services will begin next week. Services at 3:30 and 6:30. Uh, masks required, but we will have singing in both of those services. Meditation subscription is due by next week, Monday, the 15th of February. And then one uh, last item on our list here, and that is that the tech cookout, not last item on the list, but second last item on the list before the Wells Connection is the tech cookout. Just be aware that that's coming up on Sunday, March 28th. Take a look at the newsletter for instructions and what is going to be happening as to how that tech cookout is going to be organized on that date. And with those announcements, we'll now show the Wells Connection for the month of February. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. You're likely aware that Wells Christian Aid and Relief responds to events like hurricanes and tornadoes where a whole community is suffering. But another facet of the work focuses on tragedies that affect just a single family, personal grants that can make a life-changing difference for individuals in need. Lake Mills is a, a wonderful bedroom community, has a lot to offer to families, not only in raising them, but also in the activities on the lake. St. Paul has played an important role in the history of the Lake Mills area. The church has always been there. That has been the constant. That doesn't go anywhere. The ability to go and share in God's word and pray together and ask people to pray for you. And it's a normal Wednesday night, and Landon had started screaming that he had a belly bad headache, and it was really bad. And it was 
Ash Wednesday of 2019. It was during, I believe, uh, the time of our Lent service. Uh, he had the seizure. I'll never forget this because it's embedded in my head. I told my brother in law, I said, call 911, something's really wrong here. It took him right to Children's Hospital in Madison. He had a massive brain bleed, and it, his outcome was uncertain that he, if he was even going to make it alive after this. So Landon spent about 10 days, he was in a coma. Is he going to wake up? How, how do you make this decision about your eight year old child and just like hope that it's going to work, you know? And then as time, you know, progressed and we were there for quite some time, I mean, Lennon was there from March to September. It was very traumatic for everyone, especially when you see a young man go through such an experience, wondering whether or not he would survive this life. But we were also very confident that if that was the Lord's will, we knew that he would be in heaven with his Savior. At that time, he was, Lennon was not talking a lot of the time, but he went out of his way to tell the pastor to read him a Bible verse. We had made arrangements uh, that we as pastors would go to the house. I walked into his room, and the first thing he said to me is, Pastor, it's good to see you. Can you please read me a Bible story about Jesus? Read a Bible verse, because I wanted to remember Jesus. Jesus means that he died on the cross for all of us. What I loved about all of the pastors at St. Paul's is every single one of them reached out and they were like, what, what can we do to help you? Can we come and visit? Can we pray with you? Can we pray for you? What, does, what do you need from us? Well, when I realized you know, how much it was gonna cost uh, for the family to purchase a handicapped accessible van, which legally they had to do uh, to transport him, um, I knew that there was a way for us now to help them. And I found out about Christian Aid and Relief and how they can help in this way from another pastor. We do personal grants for people in our congregations who are just struggling in some aspect of life. Maybe they've got some uh, major medical bills uh, or some other financial challenge. And so we work together with congregations who contact us uh, to give those people some uh, financial uh, assistance that they need. It was just amazing, and our, and our congregation uh, to date has collected almost $20,000 to help pay for that van, and the balance was covered by Christian Aid and Relief. And without their help, I don't think that would have been possible. <laughs> it's always amazing how God finds another way to get you there or to answer a prayer you maybe didn't even know you had. And so we got the van. I mean, within six weeks, Pastor was like, here you go, we've got this, we're gonna help you. It was the Lord who held them up, and it was his strength that carried them through. And they regularly confessed that, and that was beautiful. It's just so humbling. People who we have never met, never will meet here on earth, who were willing to help Landon and help us do the things that are most important is still to be able to travel together. And um, ultimately, it's to go back and have Landon worship his Savior in, in church. To see the relief. And I think that's what Christian Aid and Relief is all about, giving them the relief that they're not alone and that they have others they can count on. Landon's story is a beautiful illustration how Wells Christian Aid and Relief offers opportunities to demonstrate our Christian love. Whether it's a natural disaster or a need at one of our world missions or a family that's hurting, Wells Christian Aid and Relief is there as a way to show love to our neighbor, reflecting the great love Jesus has shown us.